Welcome to the Leadership Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Jono White. I'm the founder and principal consultant of Clarity. We are an Australian-based consultancy that works with leaders around the world, and our passion is to invest in people to become everything they're meant to be in order to fill the world with healthy organizations that people love to work for and customers line up to buy from. The goal of this podcast is to invest in you and your leadership. If you're just joining us for the first time, then feel free to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there. The most popular being our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from around the world in all different sectors give their in-depth answers on leadership, what books they love, what they found most challenging, uh, the most meaningful stories, how they how they structure their time through the day. That's free, so go and check it out. And we'd love to interview you about your leadership. I believe you have advice from your experience, your context, and your life so far that is important and can help other leaders. It's also a great way to give back. It's free to get involved, and you can do so by going to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest, or just Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form that pops up. We have a free resource for you on our website. It's called Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook. It has interviews with 10 world class leaders, and you can go to consultclarity.org. It's right at the top and get that today. Uh, we also have a daily email that we send out to over 15,000 leaders, and that email contains the highlights, our best content from our podcasts, our blog, uh, my book, uh, the books that we're loving that are out there about leadership. It's also the best way to get access to our masterclasses and workshops before anyone else. And there's also exclusive and limited uh, special options just for subscribers. And you can subscribe by going to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe. Now my gift to you is to work incredibly hard to provide the best leadership content I can to invest in you and your leadership. So if you're finding our content helpful, if you find this podcast helpful, then your gift to me uh, could be this. If you, if you do find it helpful, then write a review or rate our content and make sure you subscribe or follow. I can't emphasize enough how helpful that is. It really does help us to get the word out there so we can invest in more leaders to become everything they're meant to be. It also means a lot to me personally when people like you and people in our community share our content on social media. So if you do that, then please do look for me, Jono White, to tag me and look to tag Clarity uh, on whatever platform you're on. And our team, including me, I, I'm always looking to see when people have mentioned us so that I can engage with you. And also we look at sharing content. So if you if you write something about something we've done, there's also a good chance we'll share that with our followers. So if you could do that, that is a massive, massive help as we try to invest in as many leaders as we can around the world. Last of all, you can check out my book about how to deal with difficult people even if you hate conflict. It's called Step Up or Step Out. It's available on Amazon. You can just look up Step Up or Step Out John O'White or you can go to store.consultclarity.org forward slash book and check it out there. I have coached leader after leader after leader and in more than 50% of the sessions, this topic comes up. How do I deal with this person? I'm finding it really difficult and, and I just want to find a way that doesn't blow up to do a really, just to have a difficult conversation, to lead them better. How do I do that? There's a three-step process that I outline in this book that I believe can help you. Okay, let's get into today's episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to another episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Today's guest is Chris Morrill, Chris is the Executive Director, CEO of the Government Finance Officers Association, GFOA of the US and Canada. Welcome to the podcast, Chris. Hey, thanks, John. It's so good to be here. First of all, before we jump into your story, tell us about uh, your role as Executive Director, CEO, what you do, and a little bit about the organization, the association, GFOA. 
Sure, yeah, so GFOA was founded in um, 1906 as part of uh, Teddy Roosevelt and several others good government movement to try to bring professionalism to, uh, to state and local government. Um, we have about 23,000 members and we provide best practices, training, advocacy for government finance professionals in states, provinces, um, cities, counties, school boards, uh, special districts like water and sewer districts. Um, and uh, yeah, it's about 23,000 members. Yeah, incredible. That's a, that's a large group of stakeholders. <laughs> and uh, I always find really associations is, associations are fascinating to me um, because I think they are, uh, it, it's a very unique group of stakeholders. And, and just from working with people who lead associations, I think um, a lot of people probably underestimate what's involved in really listening well in, in any form of leadership. But when you're leading an association, it becomes next level because of the the nature of the relationship with your stakeholders. Yeah, you, you know, so it's all it's all voluntary that their, their governments join. And uh, it's really diverse. You, you know, our, our members in Texas are different from our members in Massachusetts, who are different from our members in British Columbia. <laughs> So true. Yeah. Well, let's jump into your story, Chris. Uh, I'd love to start with your childhood, you know, looking back to growing up, what were some of the moments or even themes from that season of your life that really shaped you into the person and the leader you are today? Yeah. You know, I, I grew up in a small town in New England in Massachusetts and, uh, Early on, my, my dad, who was a, a business person, um, got involved in local government and actually uh, became mayor of my hometown. So at an early age, saw what he did, how he talked to people on the street, how you know he worked on improving the community. And um, while I didn't like the political aspect of it, I really liked that community service piece. So I, I decided pretty early on, I, I guess I was a kind of a nerd in, in middle school, I decided that um, you know, I'd, I'd love to work in local government and went on um, to get my undergraduate in political science and then my master's in public administration um, and worked my way up through local government as a budget analyst, as an assistant manager, um, as a city manager. Um, and then this is kind of the, 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 the last, the, the, the encore chapter right now, um, serving GFOA on, on, a, on a national and in many ways international level. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's, that's fascinating. I, I don't think um, I've ever heard just from the stories I've, I, I, from people I've worked with. And of course, if you work in, in local government, there would be people that you would, that you would know. But for me, that's incredibly unique as a young person to see that and think I want to serve, um, you know, I, I want to work in local government. That's, that's a fascinating and really interesting um dream and observation for a young person. Yeah. And, you know, and I had looked a little bit at state government and actually did an internship in DC, um, but really liked at the local level, you, you know, you, you know, the people you're serving and you can see if what you're doing is making a difference. Um, you know, it's challenging because, you know, a city manager, I had to know everything from police and fire to schools and public works. Um, so uh, different challenges every day, definitely. <laughs> oh, that's, um, that's incredible. So as you reflect, I mean, that's, I can hear uh, a maturity in your decision making. And um, uh, I think that's, what, that's also really fascinating at a young age to go, okay, I've done, I've done an internship over here, but no, I really, really think um, local government, like that's, to me, that's quite high level thinking for a young person. Um, can you think of one of the first leadership opportunities? Maybe it was when you were really little, maybe it was, you know, uh, mm -hmm. further when you were in your twenties or, or even thirties, it, it's different for everyone, but uh, something where you remember really feeling like you're in the deep end as a leader, you had to cast vision or you, you really were responsible for a project or a team, um, managing people. What was one of those first real leadership in the deep end opportunities for you? You know, when I think back, probably one of the most impactful experiences I had is so I, I became a budget director in a fairly major city in Savannah, Georgia, when I was 28. So moved up pretty quickly, probably wasn't prepared for it and was thrown in, but but really loved what I was doing. 
However, um, a, a new mayor was elected who came in on kind of an anti-government platform and, you know, very disrespectful to staff. She was tearing apart everything that, that I had worked on. And so I had this kind of crisis and in, in confidence that did, did I pick the right career. And so my wife and I thought, well, you know, here's an opportunity. She had just gotten her master's in library information science. And, you know, is there something else maybe we should be doing? And um, we had always thought about joining the U.S. Peace Corps as volunteers overseas. And so um, it just happened that the Soviet Union had recently uh, broken up and they needed volunteers with low government experience. And so we applied and very quickly were accepted. And so I ended up being in the first group of Peace Corps volunteers in Ukraine. So in uh, 92, at 28 years old, 29 years old, wow. uh, they drop us down in Ukraine. <laughs> uh, I'd just been independent a few months. The embassy wasn't opened yet. Not really sure what to do with this. And we kind of had to find our own way. And, um, and, and one, one experience in particular, we wanted to fit in. So when we got there, we bought Ukrainian clothes. You know, we tried not to speak English on the street. And our first outing with our uh, language instructor, we're walking down the streets of Kiev, uh, the main street, Krashavik, which you see in the news a lot now. I got my Ukrainian jacket on, uh, my Ukrainian pants and shoes, so we would fit in. We weren't speaking English. Well, people stopped, started stopping, and we could hear them talking and saying, I'm in a con that's pointing at us, and people came up and shook my hand and thanked me for being there. And we became this spectacle, <laughs> the four of us. So we ducked into a coffee shop. We asked our language instructor, you know, how do they know we're American? And he's a young guy, 21 years old, and he looked at us, he said, well, of course they know you're American. We're like, well, how can they tell? And he said, well, they can see it in your eyes. They can see that you're free. And it just took us aback that, you know, we were so privileged to grow up in a country where, mm. you know, the government was designed to serve and protect and to grow and to challenge. And uh, people could see it in our eyes that we had this sense of freedom unlike in Ukraine, part of the former Soviet Union, where government was designed to control and, and oppress in many ways. And so that kind of rejuvenated my faith in government. <laughs> and so after mm. my two years there with lots of challenging experiences, um, came back and, and actually got back into local government and kept on moving up in the profession. Wow, that's, a, that's an incredible story. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I can only imagine how formative those couple of years would have been as a person and, uh, and, and as a leader to be on the ground. Um, like you said, navigating a whole bunch of challenges, any, any particular lessons as well as what you just mentioned that you learned from your time in Ukraine? Yeah. You, you know, it was at a time where, because the Soviet union has broken up, they were, you know, I think inflation was 2000%. You know, things were not available. We were in bread lines a lot. There weren't a lot of resources. But I think there was just such a sense of hope at that point and, and people really wanting to learn from us and really tap into what we had. And it, and it wasn't, you know, we weren't bringing them technology or, or anything fancy. It was really just some basic leadership and management skills. Uh, I, I ended up working with the city of Lviv with the deputy mayor there, um, which, which we've seen a lot in the news lately. So I guess it's really that, you know, after that, nothing ever, ever seems that difficult again, no matter how bad it is. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and now watching it there, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, well, I, and I have to say, um, hmm. what's been happening in the U S in the last couple of years with the, the, um, you know, what we've had with, with some of the, the, the racial strife and other things, it, it, I reflected back on there and I thought, well, you know, I have freedom in my eyes, but do, do all Americans, you know, do we create communities where everyone had that sense of freedom? Um, and then seeing Ukraine invaded, I really, mm. after my experience, I was convinced that the Russians with their you know, superior firepower and everything would just roll right through. But to mm. see in one gen, it's, I'm hopeful because in one generation, you know, they, they really have turned around from, uh, uh, you know, where they, they, they were oppressed and, and I think didn't have faith in their government that I shoot now they're dying for it. Um, so it's been amazing to watch all that. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I was chatting with someone about the war in Ukraine recently and, and I, um, you know, they, they come from, uh, from the army and, and military and they were saying everyone 
kind of um, expected, like you just said, that Russia would, would roll over Ukraine just because of sheer numbers. But their observation was the biggest difference is the, is the difference between central command and um, commander's intent, which is something I've only learned mm. about recently, this, this idea that um, you can, you know, in, in a war, and so in, in the military, you can actually have central command where everything comes back up, down, back, you know, to one command. Um, or commander's mm-hmm. intent, which is which is uh, where, which, which in some ways takes a lot more uh, work and communication, definitely, because what right. you're doing is you're trying to you're trying to communicate the intent and then allow decisions to be made as close to the ground as possible. And they were saying that the biggest, you know, when you see, uh, in I'm I'm by no means a military anything, let alone an expert, but yeah. but this person was just saying to me when you see tanks stalled waiting a lot of that's because they're they've been given orders and times and they go exactly there and then they're waiting for the next command from central command and i thought how um how like what a living breathing example of Mm -hmm. leadership to see ukrainians um like you said against all odds just leaving the world just amazed at their bravery and um, but that was one part of it I'd never I'd never heard before that perhaps part of the reason um, on the other side that Russia's been so unsuccessful is that they haven't made decisions close to the ground. They 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 still run a central command approach as a military, and um, I think the leadership lesson in that has not been lost on me. It's like wow, we're even and and you know you think it's important when when you're making decisions in. Um, a school or in a company or in an association, but this is literally life or death. And the same principles here are are at play. Um, And, uh, and so, yeah, that's just something recently where someone said to me, that's just really, yeah. Like you said, sometimes you just, you just see things and it really, um, it it has a, has an impact on you. Um, Mm -hmm. As you reflect on your career, like you said, you've done you've done a lot since then, and so um, we can't get into everything. But I'd love to know who are some of the mentors along the way, Chris. You know, across your life, who are some of the people that come to mind? And I know you can probably list fifty, but if you just pick a couple, who are some of the key mentors who really influenced you and, and your leadership? You know, I would say one one of the the main people. Um, I, I had the opportunity. Uh, actually before Peace Corps to, to participate in a, a fellowship program called the Kellogg Leadership Program for where for three years they they paid Kellogg paid um, 25% of my salary to free me up so I could go study something not related to, to government. So I, I studied conflict resolution I'm around the world and got to go to Peru and South Africa and different places. But one of one of my mentors there, a guy named Hubie Jones, um, he's African American guy. At that point, he was probably in his sixties, and he had started uh, six uh, community foundations: um, the, the, the uh, Massachusetts Children's Choir, several other ones. And uh, he was just an—he was just a, a thoughtful, amazing guy. And I know that he had had a rough life because, um, you know, Boston in many ways uh, has a history of being a very racist city, and I'm sure it was tough when he grew up. But he was just so thoughtful and giving. And I remember at, at one point, it was really conflictual situation with a couple other fellows. And, and um, somebody was kind of baiting me. And he leaned over and he said, Chris, just don't take the bait. It's not worth it. Rise above that. And I think he did that his whole life. And because of that, he was successful. And, and I think people really recognize him nationally. And, and, and since that time, whenever he has an opportunity, he checks in with me, Chris, how are you doing? And... Um, he, it, I, I just, I think just his, um, approach to, to, to life and how he, um, addressed issues and, and conflict and challenges, um, you know, really inspired me, um, as I've, uh, mm. dealt, dealt with some of those on my own, no, nowhere to the degree that he did. <laughs> any, um, any stories like you mentioned there, um, any, any other stories that, that come to mind? Uh, of watching him or, or any other advice he gave you or, or remembering how he handled a particular situation. I always love, you know, sort of mining for stories around mm-hmm. these sort of people because, um, you know, they're there. It's just a case of sometimes, um, <laughs> uh, you know, remembering them. But he sounds like a remarkable man. 
he was, and he, and you know, he he had such a sense of humility. Even though, if you looked at what he had done, you would be amazed that you know, single handedly in a tough environment in Boston and Massachusetts, and really nationally. Um, and and I think I don't know that there was one instance, but just when you were in a room with him, you knew that he was listening intently to everything going on. And he didn't speak a lot, but when he did, it was short and impactful. And, um, and it was always very generous and giving. I, I mean, I, I, in, in fact, when I was talking to him, he, he recently retired and um, he was saying that, uh, he, you know, one thing that, that he tells, uh, that, that he has always done is if anyone ever calls him or asks for anything, why not talk to him? You know, he he's he never saw himself as so important, even as busy as he was, to not take that call or to not help that person. And I think it's it's uh, you know it's giving back to him. I think that that sense of, of generosity has paid yeah. has has paid back. Yeah, absolutely. Um, any any other mentors that that come to mind uh, that you want to talk about? Yeah, I um, I had the opportunity when I when I first started my career in Savannah, um, the mayor there, who had been mayor for for many years, um, it, uh, just just watching him out in the community and how he too, I, I I guess that's a theme. He too, you know, no matter who the person was, he deeply listened to them and you know showed that he cared. And uh, it, it was unfortunate because he was the one who actually got defeated by uh, by the anti-government person after, shoot, he'd been mayor for 28 years. Wow. Um, and, and I think just just watching his commitment and and what he did and how we approached it. And, you know, politicians often have these big egos, but, you know, it really seemed that his ambition was not uh, personally directed. It really was uh, his ambition was 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 targeted toward the community and improving the community. Yeah. That's like a superpower when you actually have someone in that, in that position of, um, of power and responsibility who authentically has that, um, humility and servant, that you know, that, that service, uh, sort of mindset. Mm -hmm. Um, I, how did you, cause you, like you said, between both of those mentors for you, Chris, you, you mentioned that ability to be present and listen. If you think back and I know there's some really obvious, simple things, um, that we could all do better, <laughs> like talking less. Um, right. but any, anything else that comes to mind about how both of those men were able to really make you feel present when you were in the room with them and, 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 how how they were able to it sounds like you felt really heard when you were working with them can you mm -hmm. unpack how they did that from your reflections yeah you know I, well first when I, I in the moment you don't you don't recognize it because i think it was just such a a second nature to them it was just how they were that they that they built up but but i think you know they were looking at i think they were extremely intentional about the experiences they created. Um, and as I look into it more, I think that's really how you bring real change to culture and move things forward is, is you're, you're very intentional and it, it's experiences that change people. It's not telling them to do something differently. It's the experiences you create for them. And so I think they had figured out um, during their leadership journey that when they're with an individual and with a group of people, they think intentionally about what kind of experience are, are they gonna create that because that's what you remember, not the words. It's 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 the experience, how they made you felt, and mm. I, I think they just had that down. Yeah, I love how you've articulated that because it's it's another level of communication and it's another level of leadership rather than just okay, I'm turning up today and uh, you know I'll try not to be too negative or I'll try I'll try to you know be kind. That's great, but thinking about as a leader, the experience you're creating for people, I think is a really interesting concept because when you, when someone has a one-on-one -on -one meeting with you, or when you're, when you're working with a team as a leader, without realizing it, you are, uh, able to create, you know, one of my favorite sayings, um, from, from one of my leaders, um, was, you know, to be 
the thermostat, not the thermometer. You know, don't be a thermometer, be a thermostat, set the temperature. And, and I think that's true with the experience. You, you can actually think through how do I set the temperature by modeling it a lot of the time. Um, what have you learned about how to craft experiences? Because you've worked with some amazing people and now you've had a lot of opportunity to lead yourself as city manager and now in this role um, and many roles. Is there anything that you've learned about how to craft experiences for the people you lead? Yes, and and, and I guess maybe by, by, by a story, um, when I started my last city manager job in a city named, uh, called Roanoke, about, about 100,000 people in the, uh, in the Virginia um, mountains, um, when I got there, it, it, it was a community that um, didn't feel good about itself. And it was very clear. I, I saw incredible potential. It's a real welcome, diverse community. It's a refugee community. They have lots of different experiences here. But people almost apologize for it, especially my coming from Savannah, which is, you know, known as a premier city in the country. And, and so I realized early on that if I could play the role of making them feel good about themselves, I mean, that's really how you build community. It's by making people love where they live. It's, you, you know, you, you don't you don't have economic development through just through tax incentives. And other things. if you can convince people to love where they live, then they become their own economic development force. And so I spent a lot of time going out into the neighborhoods and with the business community and with the philanthropic community and uh, the, the Globe University, just talking about what they had. And, um, and, and there was definitely a sense of people working together. Um, and because I think real change, come, especially with some of the big issues that we're facing now, the opioid crisis, you know, in the U.S. it's guns and other things, you have to work across sectors. And so you have to build those relationships. And, and so it was creating those experiences where we, we could prove that by working together, we could accomplish something. Then that just becomes a virtuous cycle where you get more of that happening and more people want to join. And, you know, within a few years, you know, Roanoke became, was recognized in All-American City. We reversed a 30-year population decline. We had the lowest crime rate in history. I mean, we, I mean we've got a bunch of things going. And I think it's because, um, not just me, but I get the other community leaders to be intentional about focusing on what's good and mm. being a positive, energizing leader. I think that's what, what people need to bring real change. I think if you could bottle that, <laughs> I think every yeah, leader right. in the world <laughs> would pre-order that because um, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. And it's so true. I, I think it's um, amazing as a city manager to have that approach. And I think the same approach is true because I, I it's one of the biggest questions I hear from leaders when you really drill down in what they want or what the problem is. You know, there'll be all sorts of symptoms in their teams and in their organization, but it, mm -hmm. it often comes down to I, I want people to you know, they might talk about buy-in or ownership, but they really want people to love working. You, you mm -hmm. want to create a place where people love working, where where in 30 years' time, even if they've gone and done 10 different things, they'll look back and say, that was that was special. That was, that was amazing to work there. W what advice would you give to leaders who are listening and, like I said, are on the edge of their seats going, how do you do that, Chris? Right. How, do you, how do you build, like, what advice would you give for leaders about their own teams and, and in their organizations about how to help them um, create organizations that people love to work for? You know, I think one of the key basic things is humility because um, I, I don't think, it, it's only through humility that you really ask for help and realize that you need partnerships and, and understand why you need the folks around you working with you and, and so I think humility, and not a false humility, but really authentically, you know, realizing that, it, yeah, there's some skills that I'm good at, some things I'm great, but I can't solve everything and I need people around me and let them know that. So I, I think it, just inviting people often makes a big difference and we don't stop to do that. So that, and then, and then I, you know, not to sugarcoat things, but, but I think, again, being that positive, energizing leader is critical, can be realistic about the problems. But, but you make it clear to people that, you know, you don't have all the answers, but if we get the right people in the room together, we're going to figure it out together. And, uh, and you know, keep 
moving them forward. You, when you run into problems, don't ask why, but you know, what can we do differently? And, and, and you know, I, I think good leaders have, have a good sense of themselves and their strengths and weaknesses, and then mm-hmm. find out ways to, you know, connect with other people to shore up those weaknesses and, you know, and admit your weaknesses um, uh, <laughs> is, is an important piece too. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, that's, that's great advice. Um, as we continue to reflect on your career so far, are there any big, you mentioned some wonderful stories already, but are there any other aha moments or as, as one um, guest talked about this idea of a shift? I love that idea, like a, where something shifted and you, you, mm-hmm. you realized oh, from that point forward, you thought differently about that part of leadership or um, any, any stories that come to mind of aha moments in your career or shifts in your thinking as a leader? You know, I think um, I, I've through my career, and it, and it came up through through budget and finance before a city manager. Is um, I, I think I've, I've maybe intuitively, but then we've done some research on it in my organization really about you know really understanding behavioral science and you know how people are uh, you know often irrational in decision making, um, but if you can engage them appropriately you can really help change hearts and minds and move them along. Um, it, you, you know, one example, we, we implemented a system of budgeting called budgeting for outcomes, where, you know, instead of everybody seeing a zero sum game, where we're all fighting for a piece of the pie. We actually have people working in groups together and they, um, and you actually will get more funds if you uh, can collaborate across departments. And we don't fund departments anymore. We don't fund public works. We fund safe streets. And to have safe streets, police has to work with traffic engineering, has to work with planning. And so you, to create, I, I guess it's creating that experience through a process where people have to collaborate and learn from each other. And, and that's how you solve big problems. We got to look at diversity um, mm. across all different things, including the diversity of skills and experience and, and fields of study. Yeah, I love that. That's um, and and I think those little, you know, that that's what I was saying to someone just the other day. Is um, the reason I'm so passionate about uh, working with leadership teams and executive teams in the room doing offsites is because when when you can, you know, as the leader and as the leaders of an organization, when you can change, when you can just think that slight difference, it's like a rudder on a ship. When you can just say, okay, instead of funding each department, we're going to fund safe streets. I love that. That's like that slight, that's not a big change. That's just a few words that are different, but what it represents is a whole change in direction and it flows out and you can break down silos and really see people think differently about how they work together. And and I think so much of leadership is about um, clarifying some of those things and then, and then cascading that through your whole organization as Patrick Lencioni talks about. Um, So that's, yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful um, concept. I love it. Yeah, and, it, and it's really, um, you know, I think so much is wrapped up in communication, you know, how you can, everything you do communicates, the words you choose, who you smiled at or didn't smile at, I mean, everything communicates. And it, I mean, it can, it can be a burden that leaders see, but on the other hand, if you know the folks are looking at you and, you know, if you can create the, 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 those experiences, you, you, can, you can help improve your community, improve your organization, you know, it kind of can energize you at the same time too. Absolutely. Well, let's jump into Leadership Express. I've got a few questions for you. Um, the first one is, okay. what's a book, or you can pick a couple if you want, a, a book that you've gifted a lot to other people or you've recommended to other people? Yeah, I, um, boy, you know, I, I really like um, Patrick Lencioni's work. Um, so, so about a lot of his stuff, um, I, I find one of those, you know, foundational ones is, um, good to great by Jim Collins and his concept of a level five leader. I think that still really resonates, uh, today. Um, not so much a book, but in terms of something that I, I almost read cover to cover every time I get it and, and, and pass the articles around is Harvard business review. I, I think, you know, they're kind of that, um, just in time research that they do. And some of their uh, leadership stuff is just r- really accessible. So um, yeah, that, and then I don't know if you've read anything by Chip and Dan Heath. They often yes. 
yeah, th this stuff is just so accessible and easy. And so that's that's something like when we're doing a, um, a, a, a leadership you know, reading club in, in my office, we'll use their books because it's very um, actionable, their, their recommendations. Yeah, I, I, I love their uh, their books. I haven't read everything they've produced, but I think Made to Stick, is that one of theirs? Yeah, Made to Stick is one. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I love that, reading that. And, and I'm I'm always fascinated by, um, you know, what, what particularly vision for leaders, how do you really make that portable and memorable? And I think there's some thoughts in there that are just really fantastic. Uh, next question, the five, you know, we, we hear about the 5 a.m., uh, leader and, and there's actually if you Google it and, and this is where I, some of these questions come from it's mm -hmm. one of the most read as soon as you call a blog about how to finally learn to wake up at 5 a.m. people who, are, who want to be leaders or want to be successful often dive into that so I love asking successful leaders are you a uh, you know when it comes to morning routine do you have any tips or advice on, on what you do and are you a wake up before dawn everyone should or wake up whenever you want do you have any thoughts on that as controversial as they are they're welcome right <laughs> yeah you know well um first I, I try to get enough sleep every night i think that makes a huge difference in my 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 productivity and my mood so to really try to get at least seven hours of sleep a night which is tough with i do a lot of traveling but really try to make my schedule work around that um, but but I do. I, I've over the years developed a, a routine where um, I get up and the first thing I do is about 30 minutes of uh, uh, stretching, yoga, meditation, kind of a routine I go through. It just kind of clears my mind. Um, I started because my, my back was hurting, but I, I, now it's, be, you know, it's become a whole body thing for me. So, so I do that every morning. I always have good breakfast. Um, I, I've, because of my position, um, I really need to know what's happening nationally. So uh, while I'm eating breakfast, I'll, I'll spend about 30 minutes skimming you know, New York Times, uh, Wall Street Journal, other newspapers, just so I kind of know what's happening that day in case there's something we have to be helping our members out that <laughs> might impact state or local governments. Yeah, that's awesome. I No, that's... that's uh, it, I, I love uh, some of the things you talked about there, yoga and, and stretching when you when you first wake up. And um, I, I do think one of the biggest sort of life hacks for um, energy and for um, health is if you can do some sort of exercise first up in the morning. I think that's, mm -hmm. um, you know, just, just the more I understand, which it's limited understanding, but the more I do understand about the body and, and, uh, and how we're wired and... Um, you know, our circadian rhythms and, and all that sort of stuff, you realize, wow, if you can do that, it really does get a whole bunch of things going that are in your favor to to feel good and be healthy long term and short term. So um, thanks for sharing that. Absolutely. Um, one on one meetings. This is another thing. I think thing also. That, oh, yeah, no, you go. No, and I think also having done that, I've noticed at times during the day when I do do it, I. Um, I, I don't overreact to things. I think I'm more thoughtful. Um, I pause more. Um, uh, days when I miss it because something's going on, I'm, I'm more likely to jump into things that I shouldn't or, or, or not be as thoughtful. So I, I definitely can feel a difference, even on a day to day basis. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Some great ideas there for people to try if they're looking to change that up. Um, now, one-on-one -on -one meetings, this is another thing that comes up again and again. Leaders want to know, how do I run a great one-on-one -on -one meeting if I have someone reporting to me or multiple people reporting to me and I meet, I need to meet with all of them one-on-one? -on -one. Any, any advice or um, anything that you've, that's become, once again, part of your routine when you're doing one-on-one -on -one meetings? Um, first, do them. I, I'm amazed with the number of people who, who don't meet with their, um, you know, with their leadership team members one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so I, and, and I, I, I hadn't always done this, but I, but I've started doing it probably in the last decade where, um, each of the key people on my leadership team, we have a standing half an hour meeting. Um, I set it up and I tell them up front, it's really for them to let me know what they need from me first. Um, other things may come up, but it's really about them letting me what, and, and so it, both gives me intel on what's happening in the organization, what I need to be thinking about, but also that person. 
and then um, you know several times times a year have that career conversation. You know, are, are are you getting what you need? You know, what do you want to develop? Other things you're looking at, um, and I think that that's has just made a big difference. And it's when I first started, it was so easy that something would come up and I needed to write a report or get something done and I'd cancel them. And now I'm pretty adamant about sticking with them. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it's funny what you said about just have them because I, I think one of my biggest pieces of advice to, to leaders, if I had to boil everything down um, that from chatting with great leaders and hearing what they're doing and then seeing walking into situations where uh, people are wanting to take their team to another level, as an example, I can't tell you the number of times it comes down to actually meet as a team um, or actually meet mm -hmm. one on one and then or sometimes meet more regularly because when you look at how often they actually end up meeting, the team met once, you know, has only met once in the past couple of months and you go, that's just not enough or one on ones. And of course, then we go, but yeah, but meetings can be so tedious. It's like, well, if that's the case, you're doing them completely wrong. Like you said, wrong, how right. great to know if you can meet with your boss and actually unpack what you need. Right. Yeah. There's, there's complete, there's, there should be no reason anyone should be running meetings that people hate to attend. Meetings should be, that's another Patrick Lencioni right. thought that I love death by meeting is like meetings should be the, the real, you know, this is like game day, you know, everything else you're doing it. But when you're in a meeting, that's when you're having the robust discussion and doing so much of the real work around decision-making as a team. And it, yeah. So, um, I think that well, advice alone one is, point is of that, I, yeah, and I um, early on I had a boss who um, pretty difficult, nice guy, worked hard, but he, he wasn't very personable. And I, I, if I ever got in an elevator with him, the elevator ride was, "Did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this?" And I thought I never want to be that type of boss that people don't want to get in the elevator with me and spend, you know, and go through three floors because they're afraid <laughs> I'm just going to quiz them all the time and not really care about them. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, I like that. That's that. That reminds me of something um, someone once said, like around um, hiring. They said a great filter in hiring is, um, will I like? Will I be happy to run into this person on a day off? And I know it's a really silly sort of filter, but it's that same sort of thing. Like you want to be the boss, and you want yeah. to be part of a team where you see each other on a day off and you're like, Oh, this is awesome. How, how are you? Like, it's, yeah. it's not, uh, Oh no, he's going to like, um, yeah, but I like the elevator, <laughs> right. elevator test as well. Oh no, I'll, I'll take the right. stairs. Uh, that's great. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about, um, great pieces of advice? You've mentioned a few through the podcast. So if you want to, if you can't think of anything else, feel free to ju jump onto one of those, but, um, are there any other, great pieces of advice you've been given at some point that come to mind in life in leadership can be anything yeah you know one um of the former city manager where i worked uh he said this and you have to think about it a minute but I, but it's coming to play recently but he said you'll never make me mad enough to do the wrong thing and i thought we've had some conflict recently and you know, somebody kind of uh, you know, had a personal agenda against me and it could have made me like overreact and do some things that wouldn't be in my character so i thought yeah you know what you'll never make me bad mad enough that i'll do the wrong thing and so i think that uh, it, it just has come back to me recently <laughs> with this that is so um, good you'll never make me mad enough to do the wrong thing i i think um because i hear at the heart of that is that ability to either stay calm and stay rational or realize when you're not and go, uh, uh, not making any decisions, not sending any emails until I, until I, uh, right. am not in this place. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. That's great advice because I, I, I really believe in that concept, but I haven't come across too many great sort of phrases or pieces of advice that articulate it. And, and I think that's great. You'll never make me mad enough to do, um, the wrong thing. Uh, that another one that I love is, uh, around the same sort of idea it's a bit of a different mm -hmm. take on it, which is, you know, when we respond in, in anger, but it's like, um, when you, you know, when, when you, uh, speak, when you're angry, you'll end up saying the best speech you'll ever regret. And it's like that idea oh. that when you're really, <laughs> <It's good. laughs> when you're yeah. hot with anger, it's like, man, this email is on point. And then it becomes mm. the best email you'll ever regret. Right. Because it might've been right. super on point, but then <laughs> yeah. you lose all rationality. Um, so, so that's another, another one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I, I guess another one is, you know, you know, just the idea that it, that everything communicates, you know, just, just keep that in your head. Everything communicates. So think about that, and especially when you're in that leadership role, mm. that I think initially, especially, you know, you, you approach it with humility. You think, well, what does it matter? I just have the title, but the, the reality is for many people, it does matter. And so you get to think about that and, you know, use it appropriately. Yeah. That's so good. So, so good. Uh, okay. Last question. This is so much fun, but I should start wrapping up. Um, <laughs> last question. If you could only give one piece of leadership advice to a young leader, what would you say to them? Hmm. If I could only give one piece of advice, um, I, I would say, um, you, you know, find your kitchen cabinet of, of people who, who you trust, who are going to give you their honest opinion um, to help you as you grow, because all of us need that. And so try to try to identify those people early on and then um, tap into them and also help them too. Yeah, that's so good. I, you know, so much of leadership is about people. And, and I think it's, um, it's so easy, particularly for a young leader starting out to just focus on bottom line results. But I think um, definitely the longer I've spent, uh, you know, around leaders is you just realize, you know, um, it's so much about the people you have around you, the people in the teams that you build. And, um, and if you can, if you can really intentionally seek out great mentors, seek out great people, treat the people that end up working with you well, don't burn bridges. <laughs> um, right. Never, Never, never let someone make you so angry that you do the wrong thing to take the, uh, that right. quote that I'm a hundred percent going to be using, you know, it, it really does <laughs> come down do. to that. It all comes back around, doesn't yeah. it? With, with the people. It does. Well, it does. And it, this Donna, is, where, um, where are you based in Australia? I'm in Brisbane, up in Queensland, near the Gold You're Coast. You're in Brisbane. Oh, okay. yeah. 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 Brisbane's great. And you know, just coincidentally, my association, mm. we're working a lot more with Australia because Australian mm. local governments are the best in the world on capital asset management. And oh, so the okay. whole world's learning from them. Yeah, it's been, been interesting. I've had, um, yeah, I've had some local, uh, local government leaders from Australia on the podcast, a couple, um, mm -hmm. and from Bundaberg, a regional council uh, in Queensland. And mm -hmm. yeah, I, I've been, I, I, you know, to be honest, I've probably been surprised at I thought I understood what was involved in leading in local government. And I, I probably didn't understand the sheer um, <laughs> magnitude of once again, the number of stakeholders and the number of projects you're across. And, and I've just been hearing some of these leaders unpack what they do and what they're responsible for. And not just here in Australia, but around the world. And, and so it's, um, really does, uh, I, I have been really surprised and, and just, um, astonished at, at what's involved in leading in, in local government. It's, uh, yeah, yeah and, it's and been eye opening, the, especially in the U S the, the polarization here has just made, you know, I, I mean, it has made a lot of good people leave local government because they, you know, they didn't get into it to be, you know, beat up from the left and the right. And it, it's it, people show up at meetings, screaming and yelling. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's really at a crisis in many ways. So something, something I'm trying to help our folks work with, but it's difficult. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. When you've got people who are so polarized um, across mm. your stakeholders, that's 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 just so hard. Uh, well, so much fun having the conversation. For people who really want uh, to maybe follow you online or connect with you on social media or find out more mm -hmm. about the association, where can people connect with you online, Chris? Yeah, so um, my uh, Twitter and LinkedIn is uh, at ChrisGFOA. And um, our website, which we, we have bunch of material on it is uh, gfoa.org and they can they and they can email me from the from our website too yeah happy to happy yeah to talk to anybody. excellent yeah particularly those who might be listening and in, involved in um uh any sort of local local government or maybe mm -hmm. i always know you know you never know when a podcast episode like today is just 
incredibly timely for a listener jogging along the river or mm. sitting on a train and you think, well, that, that thing that Chris said really helped me. Make sure you reach out and, and let him know. Um, I want to thank our listeners for tuning in. It's been uh, one, just a wonderful episode today. I've just loved it. Um, don't forget, I also have the John O. White Leadership Podcast and the Leadership Question of the Day podcast that you can check out to continue to invest in your leadership. But I want to finish today by saying a massive thank you to you, Chris, for being so generous with your time and being such a joy to uh, to spend time with. Thanks for coming on the podcast. My pleasure, Jana. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast as much as I did. If you're joining us for the first time, don't forget to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there, including our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from all over the world in all different roles, in different industries, answer these seven questions on leadership and leaders give these in-depth answers around how they spend their time, uh, a book that's been significant for them. It's just a gold mine. It's completely free to access. So go to consultclarity.org and look for that. We'd also love to interview you about your leadership. I believe your experience, your life, your context means that you have advice on leadership that other leaders can learn from. Yes, you, if you're going, not me. Well, no, I really believe you would have something to add. So if you're looking for a way to give back, it's completely free to get involved. And we would love to interview you through the seven questions on leadership. You just go to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest or Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form and get involved. We have a free resource on our website called the Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook, 10 world-class leaders giving their thoughts on leadership and that's completely free. It's available on our homepage, consultclarity.org right at the top. So make sure you go and get that and download it today. And we have a free daily email that you can subscribe to. We send this out to over 15,000 leaders from around the world. And uh, it contains the highlights of content from our podcasts, our blogs, um, our books, books we're reading. It's got the best content and it gives you exclusive, limited, early access to our masterclasses, workshops, new products, special offers. It's all for our subscribers. You can go to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe and join 15,000 other leaders. And you know, my gift to you is to work really hard, particularly through the Leadership Conversations podcast. I have been blown away by the quality of the leaders and I'm learning as much as anyone in doing these interviews. So I'm having a great time. And my gift to you is to keep lining up the best leaders I can to invest in your leadership. Your gift to me, if you're finding this helpful, there is something that you could do that would help us out massively. And that is to write a review and to leave a rating for our podcast or wherever you're watching or listening to this. I can't tell you how much that helps us out. Also subscribe or follow. It really does make a difference in helping us to help more leaders become everything they're meant to be. Another thing that means a lot to me personally is when I see our community share our content. So if you do share this or any other piece of content on social media, then thank you and and please do that. And look for me, John O. White or Clarity and tag us in your post. Our team is always looking for posts to engage with from our community. And there's also a chance that we'll share your content uh, to go beyond and share it with our followers. Last of all, you can check out my book. It's called Step Up or Step Out, How to Deal with Difficult People Even If You Hate Conflict. I wrote this book because 50% of the coaching sessions I have with leaders, this topic comes up again and again and again. And it's this idea of how do I have this difficult conversation? How do I lead this person better when I'm finding them difficult? Or in some cases you look and you say, I think I might be leading a difficult person. They're just quite difficult to lead or I'm finding them quite difficult to lead. So there's a three-step process that I unpack in Step Up or Step Out. 
And the amazing thing, and I've literally done this myself and I've heard it anecdotally from other leaders as I've coached them, is that if you follow this process, you will see that person step up and change their behavior or make a decision, which is to step out some of the time. Uh, 95% of the time, people will step up or step out in just four weeks. And I stand by that. It's uh, You have to read the book to understand, but uh, I really do believe in it and I've experienced it firsthand. It works. So you can go to Amazon, look up Step Up or Step Out John O. White or store.consultclarity.org forward slash book. Well, thank you so much for listening. We're going to be back with a new episode next time of the Leadership Conversations podcast. And I hope today has helped you to take another step towards becoming the leader you're meant to be. See you next time.